Good morning and welcome to another Hemp Souls Putting Into Practice podcast um, for, for our Business Map series. I'm Joe Pringle and I'm joined this morning by Lucy Lewin. Lucy, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, good morning, Joe. So yeah, my name's Lucy. I own a 85 place day nursery in the Midlands. Uh, we celebrated our 10th anniversary during lockdown. Um, and it's been a really interesting time. I, I love what I do. Um, and I love my, my setting. It's absolutely brilliant. Oh, super. We know from our experience over the last 25 years that managing an early years and child care setting, whether you be a childminder, at school club, voluntary preschool, nursery or a chain, a school, children's centre, whatever it is, is a complex task. It's one of balancing quality, health and safety with parents' needs, children's needs, funding, fees and sustainability. Earlier this year, the GFE funded Hempsels to deliver the national webinar to all types of early years and childcare providers. Um, delivered on January 19th, 2021, we were asked to share our approach, some new tools and resources, as well as highlighting all the support that already exists from a variety of different areas for anyone working in childcare. The webinar outlines steps we could take to business plan for now, summer term and across 2021. The content is structured around a six step process, one that aims to assist anyone thinking about all the necessary and difficult business decisions needed to support business change and sustainability. This is a series of podcasts. Our other podcasts have introduced the business map. We've considered what's changing, um, and looked at that section of the business map. These can all be accessed via our YouTube channel or using the links on the um, Foundation News website. So today Lucy's joining us to specifically think about the webinar and some of the emerging themes that came from it. Over 1,560 providers, actually 1,561 providers from all sectors <laughs> attended. Um, feedback was really amazing. 74% of attendees completed feedback, 92.7% um, indicated the webinar was useful or very useful, and just under 90%, 89.5% said they would be likely or very likely to use the business map resources, which is super. So Lucy, you attended the webinar and you shared your views as part of the structured discussion. Thank you very much for that. I'd love to know what your thoughts are around the webinar and the business map. Yeah, well, thanks. It was an absolute privilege to take part in it. Um, what I love about the business map is what it's given us is a framework. Um, and that framework is absolutely vital for dulling out the noise. Because if the one thing that I've realized when you are a nursery owner or a childminder is that there is so much going on. You know, there is so much noise happening in our lives, in our businesses. People want and need so much from us that actually we often run out of time or I don't really have a plan of how to approach the business of business. Um, and what I absolutely love about what the business map has created is those six simple steps that, like I say, clear out the noise and just allow us to have that permission to focus on different aspects of the business so that we can really, really structure our time. Like, you know, we've often said about the one commodity we can't get any more of is time. You know, I say it quite a lot. And actually with this, it gives us a way of picking out urgent and important jobs that need doing, jobs that are going to influence what we do going forward and actually give us more time. And, you know, on the webinar itself, that's what a lot of people were, you know, were sharing with us, weren't they, about how, you know, it's having that kind of understanding of what to do. We're all great at the pedagogy. We all really understand the quality side of things. This is about having that much focus on the business of business. Super, thank you. And there's um, so much um, positive feedback around all the um, um, contributions from the providers on that day. Lots of comments around um, the, the positivity. So I've had the privilege of looking through the pages and pages and hundreds of evaluation comments, and there are definitely some themes. There were um, a lot of comments around lower occupancy, drop in attendance, change in parental choices, which mm. obviously are impacting on finances across all sectors of early years and childcare. How has this changed across January and how this, and as the term is progressing and what advice would you offer other settings? 
Yeah, so definitely for sure it is something that we've seen. Uh, we've seen particularly a drop in our private income, as in as people, parental demand has changed. You know, the overriding kind of message from government at the moment is to only travel when necessary. Whilst early years remains open, what we're noticing is, is people's different understanding of what that essential travel means. So for us, parents maybe with siblings who are off school, some of them are seeing that journey to maybe bring all, let's say, three or four children out into the car to take one to nursery unnecessary. Um, so we are really seeing or have seen a massive change in, in what people are looking for. For us, I do feel we were a little bit ahead of the game in that for the last eight years, we've offered flexible childcare. And what I mean by that is we haven't done the kind of eight till one, one till six or all day. Um, because within my local area, there's more supply of childcare than there is demand. Right. So I've had to always think about ways of kind of being a little bit different. So for us, this flexible model, um, it works and it works by matching rotors and staff hours to needs and demand. Um, has What else has changed? For me, it's been about sitting down and really, again, you know what we said about having that business map and, and dulling out that noise, yep. using that process to think, right, who do I offer my current services to? Has their needs changed? If their needs has changed, can my business model adapt to meet their needs? So could I offer something flexible? Could I offer different hours? Do I offer smaller, you know, maybe do I condense to less days? You know, less is more. Mm -hmm. Um, well, for me, I went kind of a little bit all out. And when I was thinking about my strategic position, I also thought, who are people, new people that I could offer something to with something completely new? Um, and um, I actually have created a community space within my oh. thing. Yeah, very exciting. Built upon this need as we come out of this lockdown three to have a space where my community can come together because uh, we're a rural town, uh, our transport links are limited, and most of what our county gets is, is six to 10 miles away. So this was about me responding to what's going to be the needs of my local community. Um, and it sounds a bit of a, a martyr thing to do, doesn't it? But you know, with my savvy business head on, thinking again about those steps in the model, it's almost free marketing. You know, Absolutely. I, you bring your potential clients into your building. They can have a look and they can, absolutely. whatever the activity might be, from baby massage to birthday parties. Yeah, they can see us. They can meet the team. The children get familiar with it. You know, and it's about having that clarity and space of thought, which comes from having a framework to follow, that just gives you the chance to think like that, doesn't it? You know move away from the fear, forget everything, and just sit down and think, what could I do? What do people in my area need? Um, and yeah, I, I think it is certainly unprecedented times, don't get me wrong, you know, I've had many a, many a moment where I've sat staring into the abyss thinking, gosh, is this sustainable? What can okay. I do? But it is at all, you know, one of the things that I went straight to my local area, went to my, my parents. Um, I look at things like my local authority sufficiency surveys. You know, I've, I've made sure that I've become the master of my field in my town. Super. Now, that's really interesting because there were lots of comments and there were lots of um, um in session um, comments made around using data to inform planning. Yeah. Um, hopefully providers who, who use the map or attend the webinar are seeking out the information to help them highlight or to, that we highlighted to help them with their decision making. So tell me a little bit more then, expand on that. Yeah. How do you use such data? What data? And actually I'm interested in what could be could be done better to support providers. Okay, so um, I remember when I first 
stumbled across childcare sufficiency data. So this isn't new, is it? It's a legal requirement for local authorities to provide sufficient childcare. That's what we do the census for each year. It's not just to keep somebody busy. Um, but when I, I can remember stumbling across it, it was actually um, one of the old childcare works webinars that I'd been on that made reference to it, which made me go away and find it. I can remember pulling it out and reading it and being like, oh my goodness, this, from a business planning perspective was brilliant. It was like the market research I needed to put a business plan together done for me. Um, you know, at the time, I can tell you now, my, my local area has 946 full-time childcare places. Um, I can tell you that we need an average of 2.8 children being born to fulfill those full-time places. And I can also tell you we've only had 1,400 children born in the early years. So, there so you, you know, know where the data is. more supply than there is. Uh, <clears throat> absolutely now, brilliant. What that did for me, Joe, though, yeah, what that did, though, little fire in the belly moment is what I realised back in 2018 when I was having my epiphany was that I can't get my setting to 100% occupancy, not because of anything I'm doing, because there is not physically the children born. So my business model that I'd created that required me to be sustainable on 80 to 100% occupancy and priced accordingly wasn't achievable. So actually there was a fault there in my actual model. You know, like I always say, like if I was a builder and I was building a house, I wasn't mixing the mortar right. So there's Absolutely. no wonder it fell apart. So that childcare sufficiency data allowed me to realise, well, hold on a minute, Lucy. If the children aren't being born in Rutland, you've got options still. Um, you can spread your wings further. So cast that net out. Mm. You know, you, I sit fortunately on a, on a crossroads between some kind of big um, employment areas. Mm -hmm. So go to them, you yeah. know. People that employ people need childcare. Um, and as a result, you know, we are the preferred setting for one of the biggest employers in my town because I went to them. I gave them an attractive offer to give to their staff. And as a result, we sit as the third benefit that they offer their staff. Why, why is that data important? It's also important because when yeah, I was thinking about this, um, about local authorities, because I do realise that they're either the silver lining to some of our um, challenges or the thorn in our side. And what I realised is, is like, why, why do I have a different relationship with my LA to what I hear quite often from, from other um, kind of child minders and business owners? And it was, I've worked on the relationship. The local authority early years providers are stakeholders in my business. Okay, they've only got, they're only 30%. But nonetheless, we work in partnership to provide something. They have that legal duty to ensure sufficient childcare. And I am the, the, the kind of the person that can deliver that for them. So we yeah. have an agreement. So actually, when we work together, then like a marriage, you know, I'm, I'm married to the local authority. But, you know, <laughs> it's good and bad. And, you know, sometimes they all make a decision that's a little bit, really? So I'll go to them and we'll have a professional discussion. I will ring them first of all. Well, I'll, I'll always email first, but then I'll call and say, right, you know, you've just put this out. Um, here's a classic, classic example. So they've been talking about lateral flow testing. And the post came out to say that in order to have it, you had to live and work in Rutland. So I went back to them and said, well, that is literally impossible. You know, most of my staff travel to the town. Yep. And actually, it, it, it was a typo, Joan. It should have said or, not and. Right. Now, I think what I'm trying to say is I think because I went straight to them and said, this, is, this isn't right, this is not going to help anybody, they were able to see it and they were able to change it. You know, I'm a great, I'm yeah. a great believer in, you know, like I said, working on that relationship. So now we're at that point in our marriage where, you know, we, we bounce ideas off each other. So, you know, recently where the kind of the whole... Um, funding thing exploded about transparency and everything the first thing I did was I emailed my LA early years advisor and I said this is what I do this is why I do it she came back to me we had a discussion she agreed with my points I agreed with some um, kind of uh, little bits that she put towards and at, at the end of that we are now two stakeholders in the improving children's lives with a shared agreement I can carry on operating my business model the way I was with a tweak. They're happy that I'm fulfilling my statutory guidance on their behalf. 
I think yeah, absolutely. And I think <laughs> I, I think that that two way dialogue and it should be a dialogue between local authorities and their providers and that confidence that providers are able to feed in, whether it be through individuals or through provider reference networks. groups, but reference groups and networks that mm. actually are um, spokes people for um, the sector, not the individual um, and part yeah. of the market, etc., is really important. I'm old school. I've not been in a local authority for 10 years, and that's exactly how we used to used to operate. We used to have things like area childcare planning networks, snappy title, um, yeah. where we used to, you know, to be open childcare, to expand childcare, to increase your nursery class places. It would be an open dialogue around what was needed in, in, in the area. Part of our managing our money and the sure start funding at the time, but more so that providers started to understand the sufficiency within a, in a local area and started to understand the decisions that, that they were making by increasing the school nursery by 10 places would have potentially this impact. So that grown up dialogue that needs to happen. One of, one of the things that comes out in, in the comments about yourself and all the other um, participants on the webinar is around the, the positive outlook that you all had in, in such difficult times, you all had that positive outlook and we're, we're looking at the bright side of how you coped with recovery business throughout and as you move forward. Now, personally, there were lots of comments about your approach to time management and your process map which I am sure and um, people, well, I know that people wanted more information. So can you give me a little bit of information and maybe um, a little bit more detail around your time management and your process map? Okay, so the one thing that I realised in the depths of the doom and gloom, what I probably need to, to let you know, Joe, is, is that in, in 2018, December 2018, I couldn't pay my staff. So my business, I'd taken my eye off cash flow, I had made some not great decisions and as a result there I sat with my team of 20 with 2,000 pounds in the bank so not even enough to give them all a little bit I um, think we had a dialogue at that time yeah yeah well you would have done I rang everybody <laughs> <laughs> because I was desperate you know one job I had and that was to pay my team they worked so hard for me so and that, but the reason I say this is that you know I've not had it easy so, you know, the light that I shine now shines because I've come from the very, very bottom yeah. very, very quickly. So what was the lesson I learned? I learned that the one commodity I could not get any more of, despite my best efforts, was time. Um, so in order for me to get everything done that I need to do now, I'm a mother of five. I've got three of my own children and two stepsons. Um, so I've got a very busy home life. Uh, my husband is a self-employed builder so you know there is that kind of need to balance Lucy the person with Lucy the business owner and what I wasn't prepared to do any longer was make sacrifices my children I felt had sacrificed enough so I looked at all the jobs that I had to do or thought I had to do in a day it blew my mind Joe right I wrote down everything um, and I then went through and I decided that I was going to just um, highlight the ones that were ultimately only me that could do, right? So, and some of them were a bit like, oh, oh, should you highlight that? But I did. And what was really revolutionary to me uh, and kind of a big part of this is letting go of some of the control was understanding that actually it's not me that needs to do everything. Um, so what I actually did was, I looked at all, I started to group all the different tasks that you have as a nursery manager or an owner. And what I realized was, is that for me, there were four key business jobs. There was Lucy, the accountant. So Lucy, the accountant would do uh, anything to do with numbers, fit and figures. So invoicing, credit control, budgeting, payroll, all of those things. And I said to myself, is there a 10 hour a week job there? And yeah, there there was. So that got parked. Then the next job for me was kind of staff supervision. Now within that was not only me supervising my staff, but being supervised myself. I truly, truly believe you cannot pour from an empty cup. And actually a supervision is only as good 
as the amount that you've got to give back. You know, it's a kind of a little bit Maslow's hierarchy of needs, isn't it? You know, the closer you are as the supervisor to that self-actualization and the more you've got dripping back into your own pot, the more you've got to give. Wednesday, so that, that was Monday and Tuesday I've just described to you. Wednesday, I was business development manager. Imagine that. Imagine having 10 hours a week to work solely on marketing and developing your business. So that's the days where I would sit. Um, I used a tool called um, Content Cow to post my social media presence because that meant it was one day a week. All of my social media got done for the following week. Yeah. And I did all sorts. They're the days that I went to networking meetings. They were just the days that I solely worked on promoting my business. Um, back in the day, I then took a Thursday off because I'd had three 10 hour days. I was quite pooped. Um, but then Friday for me was office management. So that's where I did my filing. That's when I did all the things that, um, you know, like staff holidays, making sure the filing was done, making sure that everybody had got all the resources that they needed ready for the week ahead, overseeing the shopping and all that kind of thing. Now, the one thing that I made sure I did when I was going through this process was I was very strict with my time. And I used to say to myself, say I was sat in business development mode on a Wednesday and um, a query came in about an invoice. I would say to myself, is this urgent and important? Would I call in the accounts lady on her day off to deal with this? If the answer was yes, I dealt with it there and then. If the answer was no, it got left till Monday. I shared this with the parents. I sent them a big email saying, right, to work on the efficiency and the effectiveness of the setting, this is what we're going to be doing. Mondays is this day, Tuesdays is this day, Wednesdays is this, Thursdays is this, Fridays is that. And actually within two weeks, I was inundated with really positive messages from parents that were just saying, wow, you know, we were a bit dubious, you know, can only talk to you about our invoices on a Monday, thought everything could get forget forgotten. But a bit like with the children, you know, like when you are fully involved in something, what I found was I was far more product productive, errors went down, you know, I wasn't making tardy, stealing time errors, I was actually really, really efficient and effective. Actually, I was a little bit too efficient and effective. And what I found was I actually had to make myself semi redundant. <laughs> <laughs> Within two months, I no longer need 10 hours a day for each of the different right. jobs yeah and um, within two months I only needed five hours a day so actually what I was able to do then was condense you know the accounts lady became the accounts lady and the office admin so that was just 10 hours on a Monday yeah which meant I had more time to do different things now that could be research development look at working on my business you know like we said about the business map clearing the noise that's exactly what I was able to do I was able to sit down and say right well actually now I've got 10 hours on a Friday that's not needed for me in the business let's really work on it let's make some strategic plans let's become a CEO of my own company let's start talking 10 years time five years time yeah, so it was yeah, really interesting. Uh, I mean, fascinating. And I think time management is a key. You know, I think one of the key things I've always tried to do when, when I'm working with providers is that we all work really hard. It's how smart we work is, yeah. and, you know, and what you've what you've done is is smartened up and really put together something that works for you. There were lots of comments um in reading through the the, the hundreds of them that I have. And I was really surprised how many people were, were new or were thinking about um, starting their, their business. And there's some great stuff in what you've just, just shared. But if you had one top tip for somebody who was new or considering starting, especially at this current moment in time, what would it be? Gosh, have I got to limit it to one? Absolutely, because <laughs> there's so much that you've just okay. shared in that last yeah. in that last one part. and a half then, Joe. Let's go one and a half. Okay. I will say the thing that I would do if I had my time again is I would start with the systems and processes. I naively believed that as long as I had a big heart and I wanted what was best for the children, that the rest didn't matter. And actually it does. I thought systems and processes belonged in a factory. And I thought that actually by having them in a nursery, it would make the nursery too rigid 
and go completely against my values and my ethos. Yeah. No, they didn't. You know, they they underpin everything you do. Um, I wrote an operations manual um, and I would say that would be, if, if I could give somebody a pearl of wisdom, I would say do that from the beginning. Don't buy one because buying an operations manual just gives you somebody else's view on what should happen. Yeah. It was the process that I went on scrutinizing every single aspect of my business and writing it down that gave the operations manual the power and the influence that it has today but i do think everything needs a system everything needs a process um and then the half that i wanted to add to it is setting boundaries you know okay. burnout is not a badge of honor you know giving your all working 70 80 hours a day being busy isn't sustainable so actually set boundaries you know and say this is what i'm going to achieve today and when i get to a point whatever hasn't been achieved waits um because you are less productive the more busier you are if that makes sense absolutely you're better to do something well for an hour than half-heartedly for two or three hours. Um, and I think that's something we're not very good at. You know, every time you say yes to something, what are you saying no to? I would absolutely agree. And I think what lockdown has taught me from being somebody who was out and about, working with providers, working with local authorities, with travel to bring you down after you've done this training session or that piece of work, I've had to, just like you, be really clear about putting some boundaries in. Um, so it's absolutely super. So two final things to, to think about. Um, there were two particular um, comments that struck a chord with me when I was reading through and I pulled them out. One is um, a provider suggesting it would be useful to have a mentor system for sole providers, managers to learn from each other, potentially through networks or something. And then the other one was, how do you establish links with local providers who may consider themselves to be in competition with you? I'd love to hear about your thoughts, how we can possibly square that circle. Because actually, with a business, with a passion for business support I have, I would love to think it's time for all areas to have support networks, potentially focus in the same way that we used to around quality, net, you know, about quality and curriculum um, um, development. So I'd love to hear your thoughts, really. Yeah. So, yeah. Do you know what, Joe? That gets me like a little bit of an excited belly when you mention that. Imagine if we could do to, to business models, to, to sustainable businesses, what's happened to quality over the years. You know, if you just look at the stats on how many nurseries are now rated good or outstanding, that's down to the determination and the, the hard work around quality, isn't it? Imagine what our sector would look like if we did that on our business models. Um, I'm like you. I think there is a immense need for support mentoring around just solely the, the business of business in early years. However, this comes with um, its own challenges because the unlike quality where as much as we're, we're different in our quality, ultimately there's more similarities in quality than there are business because yeah. we've all got different drivers. Um, I remember somebody saying to me once, you know, what is your why? Why are you in business, Lucy? And I was like, well, because I wanted to own a business. She went, mm, that's not true. <laughs> and, that, you know, I think one of the things, we're not in business to just be in business. We're in business, especially as childminders and, and nursery owners, because we wanted to fulfill a need. Now, we almost are embarrassed to say that that need is something materialistic or personal. Um, I personally want to create a legacy. I want to create something that goes beyond me and becomes bigger than me. Um, I am a massive advocate for coaching, mentoring and support. Um, again, it's that saying, isn't it? I'd much prefer 1% of the efforts of 100 people than 100% of my own effort. Yeah purely because it is when I surround myself with my colleagues and my peers and we share solutions and we share ideas that 
there's real power in what we do it's that crowd mentality isn't it of let's all get together share what works because in that comes some really really useful tips okay it's not directly transferable often often you need to take somebody's idea and mix it with your ethos and your values to create how it's going to work for you but it's a seed nonetheless isn't it you know I see coaching and mentoring as almost like the greenhouse um, and we're all the little seedlings in our little uh, upside down milk bottles. And those that get the support have got the canes, they've got the bio feed or whatever it is, and they're flourishing. Um, whereas those oh, those of us sometimes that try and do it on our own are not so lucky and don't actually get to fully flourish. Well, that's uh, a metaphor. <laughs> no, absolutely. And I mean, one of the one of the things that um, I miss um on zoom calls not being and not doing training or delivery in rooms are those light bulb moments mm -hmm. where you have and, and many of the light bulb moments don't come from the trainer or the tutor at the, at the, at the front <laughs> they come from they they come from other people in the room ah. and when you see those light bulb moments that somebody whether that be um, um i'm not on my own um, it's not only me doing this or I hadn't thought about that or that could be a solution and I miss light bulb moments I miss that look in people's eye because you don't get it the same even oh. with cameras on in a zoom room or a team's room as you do so absolutely and I, I, I'm like you I think that there is a, a, a wealth of um, knowledge out there mm -hmm. um, but I also know having been in a room with many of them over the period since June there are many people who are struggling and just need that hand holding that direction or those light bulb moments yeah. and you know what Joe? some of it is that that permission permission not to be okay you know these have been some awful times and I don't want to belittle anybody who is struggling at the moment it it's okay you know it's okay not to be okay and just imagine, you know, that there are those tools out there, aren't there? There are people that will help um, because at the end of the day, we are in this sector because we care. Absolutely. And if we could give as much care to our peers as we do to the children and the families, that would be really empowering. And um, you talked about competition. Um, again, that's something that I find really fascinating in that, you know, it's almost like stay in your own lane um because people often say again you know like i've said there's more supply in my local area than there is demand so you could argue it could be a very doggy dog um uh, local area, but we're not we we are all unique in our differences you know no two settings in my local area are the same and you know i actively promote the others you know if you like what i offer you come to me if you weren't keen or whatever i will give you recommendations of other settings you know i'm really proud that kind of some of the some of the people that i've trained have gone on to manage other settings in my life you know two miles up the road to me that's an absolute privilege that i have trained somebody so well that they've been able to go from an early years practitioner to the manager of a setting i don't see it as competition i just see it as career progression absolutely absolutely well i have got to say that that has been fascinating it's been really great to unpick further um some of the the things that you were talking about um, at the webinar and i am sure that there are many things in in your feedback and your open and frank because that's exactly what we what we need um feedback that will help other people when they watch this podcast so vodcast will be available um or like all the others on our um youtube channel and you can access the rest of the series should you want to on the foundation years website so all that that leads me to do now is to say a very big thank you to you lucy for giving up your time and joining us and to uh, thank those of you who are watching the vodcast today hopefully there will be some um um some light bulb moments for you to take away in the um, um stuff and the information that lucy shared with us absolutely thanks Jane. Thank you.